Hello, hello. Welcome to our introductory lecture for animal behavior. What this lecture is going to do is outline how we approach the study of behavior in non-human animals and give you a sense of the scientific and logical foundation we use to ask questions about what animals do under given environmental conditions and why they do those things. Now, before we can get into any great detailed discussion about the types of behaviors animals exhibit, we have to have some comprehensive definitions about what we mean when we use the word behavior. The best working definition we have as animal behaviorists for the idea of behavior is this. It's behavior is the coordinated responses of whole living organisms to either internal or external stimuli, or sometimes a combination of both. So this is kind of a technical definition. What does it really mean? What it breaks down to is the idea that behavior isn't just a single action by an organism. It's a whole body response, a whole organismal response to stimuli that are either being generated by that animal's own internal physiology. Things like hormones can dictate behavior. Uh, also physiological states like hunger, uh, being sexually active or able to reproduce, all of those internal states can dictate how an animal is going to respond to its environment. And of course, external stimuli, meaning stuff in the outside world that triggers a behavioral response, that external stimuli is also going to determine what kind of reaction the animal has to the world around it. Is it a scary stimulus? Is it an attractive stimulus? Is it comforting? Is it alarming? All of those things are going to elicit or bring out unique responses from the animal. When we study all of these different causes of behavior and the behaviors themselves, what we're really studying is what's called ethology. It's the systematic or organized study of animal behavior using the scientific method. We are going to spend an entire lecture talking about the scientific approach to answering questions which involves using the scientific method to gather data and then interpret that data. Now, the way that ethology as a field has been structured for the last 80 years or so is around what are called Tinbergen's four questions. These are also sometimes referred to as Tinbergen's four levels of analysis. I'm going to talk you through who Nico Tinbergen was. He was a big time animal behaviorist. He laid the foundation for a lot of the uh, approaches we currently use to studying behavior. Um, he's considered to be one of the major founders of the field of ethology. Yeah, he was an old white guy. A lot of the scientists we're going to be talking about happen to be old white guys, but not all of them. Some of the major breakthroughs in animal behavior were made by people who were not white and who were not male. Okay. So you're going to get a slightly more diverse uh, view into the world of um, ethology and famous ethologists. Now, Tinbergen's four questions are questions we ask ourselves when we're examining the behavior of an animal to try to structure our understanding of why that behavior exists and why the animal is exhibiting it right then under those circumstances. Now, there are two categories of questions that we ask about an animal's behavior. The first are called proximate questions, which are more immediate. They have to do with why the animal is doing that thing right now under these circumstances. And ultimate questions, which ask, why did that behavior evolve in the first place? How did it develop over evolutionary time? Where did it come from? And how has it persisted in that group of animals um, up until this point, so that we're seeing it now in this particular individual animal? Proximate analysis and ultimate analysis uh, look at the causes of a behavior from these two different perspectives. Okay? Proximate causes affect the individual in that very moment. For example, if you are fleeing a predator, for like, say, you are this very unfortunate little vole, this guy right here, okay? This vole is actually fleeing another wolf that is located off screen. Now, why would that vole be fleeing that other wolf? It doesn't want to get eaten. 
Now, clearly, it's not doing a very good job of avoiding being eaten, <laughs> you know, but originally, the reason it leapt away was to avoid dying, avoid being eaten by this other wolf. So what's the cause there, the immediate proximate cause? Survival. He doesn't want to die. Okay? That's self-preservation. That's the proximate cause of this fleeing behavior. Okay? Now, we can also ask what the ultimate causes are of this behavior. Why do prey animals flee predators in general? What causes shape the behavior in the entire population over evolutionary time? All voles exhibit this particular behavior of fleeing a predator. How did that come to be? Well, probably the voles we see today still exist. They haven't gone extinct. They still exist because they've been able to avoid predators long enough to have babies and replace themselves. Voles have been fleeing predators for millions of years. If they didn't have this behavior, they would have died out a long time ago. All of them would have been eaten. There'd be no more voles today. So the proximate reason for this behavior is the vole itself doesn't want to die. Ultimately, that desire not to die, which triggers the behavior of fleeing, it evolved to keep voles as a group alive and to keep them from going extinct. Now, we can break down Tinbergen's levels of analysis not only into proximate and ultimate causes, but also into the specific types of proximate causes and the specific types of ultimate causes that drive the evolution of a behavior. Proximate causes, right here, they can be broken down into either mechanisms or development. Now, the trick here is that proximate causes affect the individual. So think that particular animal, that particular individual, what's causing them to behave in the way that they do? Okay. Mechanism refers to the actual mechanical stimulus. Mechanical means an actual thing. You can touch it, you can observe it, you can poke at it. The mechanical stimulus in this case, for our picture here, would be seeing the coyote, the rabbit visually spotting that coyote. That's the stimulus. The individual's reaction is to move its legs so that it's running away. Okay, so very specific. Mechanism is really, really literal. It's very specific to exactly what's happening in that moment. Development refers to how this particular behavior can be modified as an animal matures. Rabbits will get better as they age at spotting coyotes in the wild so they can start running away from them even faster. As the rabbit matures and gets older, it legs, its legs will get longer, its muscles will become stronger, and it'll be able to flee more quickly. The way that it develops in, the, in utero, we call it, so in the womb, when it's still maturing, when it's fetal, that can also play into this category, is how does that animal's physical development contribute towards it being able to achieve this particular behavior of running away fast enough to survive? Now, ultimate causes are bigger picture, okay? So think instead of this individual organism, think about the evolution of, or excuse me, think about the behavior of entire groups of organisms. Okay. Why would this behavior exist? in this entire group of prey animals. All rabbits flee when they see a predator. Okay, this is an almost universal thing. How did that come to be? Why does that, evol why does that characteristic evolve? Why does it happen? There's two major ways you can examine this. You can look at the adaptive function of the behavior. Adaptive function refers to how does this behavior increase an animal's ability to survive and reproduce? That's something we refer to as fitness. The fitness of an organism refers to both its ability to survive 
and reproduce. Usually we think of this in terms of animals being able to survive long enough to reproduce. And we'll go into this in more detail in our evolution lecture. Right? So adaptive function refers to how this particular behavior has allowed this entire group of organisms to evolve over generations, long enough at least to replace themselves, to have offspring that replace them in the next generation. Evolutionary history takes adaptive function and expands it. So you're not just looking at a few generations of rabbits, or you're not just looking at this particular generation of rabbits. You're looking at all rabbits since the species evolved millions of years ago. How did this particular behavior first arise in this group and change over evolutionary time? How has it been refined to better serve this rabbit's needs of survival and reproduction? They've developed better eyesight, they've developed faster leg muscles, they've developed better reaction times. All of these things help them to better evade predators, which of course means better survival and better chances of reproducing. I like this chart because it's a nice breakdown of how we think about these levels of analysis. In this case, on this chart, ultimate is up here, so don't get confused. On the previous slide, ultimate was the second group, now it's the first. Proximates up here, okay. or I'm sorry, down here. This first column deals with what we think of as what questions. It's an explanation for this one particular organism or this one particular species. Okay. Adaptive function is the first of our what questions. What does this behavior do? for the organism in terms of helping it to survive or helping it to reproduce. What is the advantage for this one individual? Okay. Mechanism, in this case, deals with what aspects of that organism's uh, body, what aspects of its, itself as an individual underlie the behavior, what cause it. Is this rabbit experiencing a heightened fear response because of certain chemicals being released by its brain? Are those chemicals priming the animal's body so it's able to move more rapidly and more immediately? What are the physical mechanisms that are causing this behavior to happen? Are its eyes uh, adapted well enough to see the outline of the, of the coyote even if it's camouflaged? Okay, so think of mechanisms as being very physical, having to do with the body itself. How questions are our other category. Okay? These are explanations of how that organ, how that behavior came to exist, how it came to be. Okay? Evolutionary history is our ultimate level of analysis for how questions. It's what's the evolutionary history of the behavior? How did this behavior first arise in this group of organisms millions of generations ago? And how has it persisted until now? Development asks about how the behavior developed within the individual's lifetime. Did it have to learn this behavior? Was it born knowing how to do this behavior? Okay. How did its body develop in order to allow it to achieve a good form of this behavior? All right, so those are the basics when it comes to defining the terms we use to study behavioral uh, adaptations in animals. What we're going to talk about now are what are called the foundations of behavior, the foundations of behavioral science. These three foundations are what provide the context and also a framework that will allow us to understand the functions of behaviors and their origins, how they evolved, where they came from. We are going to have separate lectures on each of these foundations. That's how important they are and also how um, information heavy they are. It's going to take us a while to talk through all three. What I'm going to do today is give you an overview of the three so you know what's coming. The first of our foundations is evolution, specifically what's called natural selection. The second is individual learning. And the third is what's called cultural transmission or social learning. Our first foundation 
evolution through natural selection, basically states that the frequency of an, of an adaptive gene will increase in a population over generational time. And again, we're going to spend a whole lecture on this, so I'm not going to go into too much detail right now. Basically, what this means is that genes that are adaptive, adaptive means they help you to survive or they help you to reproduce, will become more common in a population. They'll become more frequent. Okay? And they'll become more frequent over time, but not over years or over decades, over generations. So as new generations are born into a population, the offspring in each new generation will exhibit adaptive behaviors more and more often. Okay? The way that these behaviors are passed down is through genes. Genes are pieces of DNA that code for a certain behavior. Many behaviors are actually dialed into your genetic code. You're born with them. Genes that encode behaviors that are very adaptive and help you survive, they tend to be favored. They're passed on more often. So offspring in future generations, more, or I should say more offspring in each future generation, tend to receive that gene that gives them a beneficial behavior. So the behavior itself becomes more common over time. The take home message here is that natural selection increases the frequency of different behaviors over generations. And those behaviors that are increasing in frequency are ones that help you survive and reproduce. Our next foundation is called individual learning. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Individuals accumulate knowledge, they gather knowledge and behaviors during their own lifetime. So as they learn how to best handle situations they encounter in their environment, they remember that winning strategy for handling that situation, and then they use it over and over again. Now, there's two <clears throat> approaches to understanding individual learning in animals. As always, it's going to be the proximate or the ultimate approach. The proximate approach to explaining learning is, or examining learning is to ask how learning affects behaviors during an organism's life. So do they learn new beneficial behaviors and then continue to employ them? Do they also learn what behaviors don't help or don't work and then avoid them? So you're again, proximate analysis, you're looking at the individual animal. The ultimate approach is to ask how natural selection has affected the organism's ability to learn. And notice ability is italicized here. You can't learn what you haven't encountered yet. Learning involves taking in new information and figuring out how to use it to your advantage. What DNA can do for you, what genes can do, is encode your ability to learn. Are you capable of learning? Are you capable of remembering things that you've learned so you can use them later? Genes that allow you to learn and allow you to remember are the ones that get favored by natural selection. That's why we say in our ultimate questioning, how does natural selection affect your ability to learn? Okay. Organisms can evolve to be good learners. <clears throat> now the key thing with individual learning is that it alters the frequency of behaviors during the lifetime of a single organism. Any information that you've gathered during your life, you can't pass on genetically to your offspring. It doesn't work that way. You can pass on your ability to learn. If you're good at learning, that can be passed on so that your offspring are also good learners. But any actual information you've learned, it can't be passed on through your genes to your offspring. So individual learning really only alters the frequency of behaviors during the lifetime of the organism that did the learning. Their offspring have to start over and do their own learning from their environment. Okay, so this is restricted to just the lifetime of a single organism. Our last foundation is cultural transmission, which is also called social learning. This is where individuals learn new behaviors, not by trial and error or by their own experiences with the environment, but instead by learning from others. This is learning by copying other individuals. The advantage to this is, is it allows for really rapid transmission of new behaviors during a single lifetime. Because instead of you having to go out and have a whole bunch of experiences in your environment and learn by trial and error, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, 
someone else has already done that work for you. All you have to do is watch them and copy what they do if it's successful. Okay? This is also the only kind of learning that can be passed generationally, and this is key. Okay? Cultural transmission. It alters the frequency of behaviors both during an individual organism's lifetime as it learns new behaviors from others, from watching them, and accumulates those behaviors and starts to use them itself, but it also changes the frequency of behaviors in the next generation as each individual teaches their offspring how to behave. So instead of your babies having to go out and learn from scratch, you teach them how to respond to different situations in the environment. They get a head start, okay? This is kind of like what we do in school or in um, raising our children and teaching them how to cook, how to clean, teaching them how to keep themselves clean, teaching them what foods are safe and which ones are poisonous. Instead of letting our babies figure all that out themselves, we teach them, okay? That's cultural transmission. So individual learning only affects you. Cultural transmission or social learning affects your behavior and your offspring's behavior and your siblings' behaviors as well. Okay. Now, there's a number of different ways that we can use these foundations of uh, knowledge about understanding behavior to uh, study the animals that we are interested in. But there are actual different approaches to studying behavior as well. So these are different scientific approaches, different ways to organize our own understanding of the behaviors we're seeing. The three major approaches, now these are our approaches to studying behavior, are a conceptual approach, a theoretical approach, or an empirical approach. The very best research projects actually use all three. So when you're thinking about animal behavior and questioning why a particular animal is doing a particular thing, try to think in all three of these realms. Okay? All three of them contribute to what we consider to be the study of ethology. The conceptual approach just connects two previously separate ideas to explain a larger observed pattern. So. In the conceptual approach, you're using what you already know and understand about behavior to explain something new. Kin selection is a great example of this. Okay. Kin selection is based on the idea that natural selection favors behaviors that increase both individual fitness, meaning your specific ability to survive and reproduce, and it also favors behaviors that increase the fitness of close relatives. This was a game changer. When the idea of kin selection was first suggested, it actually defied and then eventually changed the previous, what we call an evolutionary paradigm, which was sort of the, the concept of evolution that was accepted to be true at the time. At the time, we thought natural selection only favored characteristics that increased your own fitness. That the only characteristics that were beneficial were ones that kept you alive or allowed you to reproduce. And yet, what we saw were behaviors, especially in groups of social animals like primates, behaviors that seemed totally counterintuitive. They were behaviors that would harm the individual in order to keep their offspring alive or to keep their brother alive. That's kind of the opposite of what we thought evolution was about. That's sacrificing yourself to save someone else. That definitely doesn't help your fitness. It hurts your survival, and in hurting your survival, it probably screws up your ability to reproduce. And yet, those behaviors showed up generation after generation after generation. They were never weeded out of the population. So, two previously separate ideas here were that we thought natural selection only favored what you could think of as selfish acts, ones that kept you alive and helped you reproduce. But we also knew that animals sometimes acted selflessly and sacrificed themselves in order to keep others alive. Okay? So how do you reconcile the two? That's what kin selection is about. Okay? Kin selection 
suggested that animals don't just have one kind of fitness, that staying alive and reproducing wasn't the only way to be fit from an evolutionary perspective, that there are actually two components of fitness, direct and indirect. Indirect fitness is how an individual's behavior affects the reproductive success of, its, of relatives in its own generation. And this is a weird concept. Direct fitness is the idea that behaviors that are favored keep an individual alive and help it to reproduce. Indirect fitness was the new concept. The idea that an individual's behavior would be favored by evolution, would be favored by natural selection, if it also kept their siblings alive. But not just one sibling or two. It tended to be you'd see an individual sacrifice themselves if it saved a number of their siblings, a group of them. The explanation for why this occurred was this. Some of that individual's genes are shared by its siblings. Okay? About half of your genes are shared by your brothers and sisters. If you sacrifice yourself to save two or three of your siblings, you're actually sacrificing yourself to save one and a half times your own genes. If that sounds a little weird right now, don't worry about it. We're going to talk about kin selection more later on. Okay. There's a slightly easier uh, to understand example here on the slide, though. It doesn't involve sacrificing yourself. It just involves sacrificing energy and time. When you give time and energy to another individual, you're actually harming yourself a little bit. You could use that time to go and forage food for yourself. You could use that energy to groom yourself or to sleep or to, <laughs> not to sleep, to groom yourself or to forage for food. You could use it to benefit you. However, you could also dedicate it to taking care of your siblings through acts like grooming. These are vervet monkeys. Vervet siblings spend huge amounts of time grooming each other. The reason is they're removing parasites from each other, parasites that cause disease and can wind up killing the monkey if they're not removed. These siblings are spending a huge amount of time grooming one another. They're sacrificing a lot of time and energy to take care of their siblings. That doesn't really follow if you assume that direct fitness is the only fitness that exists. But it does if you think in terms of kin selection and indirect fitness. By keeping their siblings alive, they're ensuring that their siblings survive long enough to reproduce, and any genes that their siblings pass on to their offspring are genes that are shared by the monkey that was doing the grooming. So the monkey doing the grooming is actually helping their own genes to be passed on by keeping their siblings alive and ensuring that they reproduce. It's a weird way to think about things, but we're going to be doing a lot of this kind of logical work this semester, and it can be a lot of fun, so I hope you stick with it. All right, I'll see you next time.